Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first installment of the new speaker series, Reimagining the University, which is sponsored by the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. I'm ben Benjamin Shul, co-director of the Center on Modernity and Transition. And I'm Shahrzad Sabet. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. And together with Ben, I direct the Center on Modernity and Transition. This series brings together leading thinkers to explore the historical foundations, contemporary patterns, and possible transformations of the modern university. In our inaugural session today, we're delighted to be joined by Susan Peterson and Chad Wellman to discuss what makes a research university. Susan Peterson is Governor Moore's Professor of History at Columbia University. She's the co-editor of the 2005 book, Settler Colonialism in the 20th Century, and the author of The Guardians, The League of Nations and the Crisis of Empire, which won the 2015 Kundel Prize in Historical Literature. Chad Wellman is Professor of German Studies at the University of Virginia. He's the co-editor of the 2017 book, The Rise of the Research University, and the author of Organizing Enlightenment, Information Overload and the Invention of the Modern Research University. Susan, Chad, a very warm welcome to you both. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. As our loyal audience members know, we like to begin these conversations on a more personal and biographical note. So to start, I want to ask each of you to tell us a little bit about some of the personal and intellectual experiences that shape your thinking about the modern research university. Chad, for you, the modern university has been a major research interest. What are some of the pathways that have led you to think and write about this theme? I think for much, uh, definitely as an undergraduate, um, my parents didn't go to college. Uh, so college, at least, was just a sea of opportunities. I mean, that's simply what it was, a, a way to get out and a way to leave. Uh, and then graduate school almost by accident seemed like, oh, well, you can go and you can continue reading. You like to read, you you, you read kind of well. So another series of opportunities. And then of course I wanted to, uh, wanted a job. And so I never at least self-consciously and deliberately reflected on uh, the university, college, much less the research university. And uh, it definitely wasn't an object of, of analysis, uh, as, as it were. And so when I, I was working on my second book, I thought it was going to be um, a history of Google, Google before Google, kind of uh, search engines uh, over the course of the Enlightenment up through uh, PageRank. And this was, uh, I thought I was halfway through June 2012. And then all of a sudden, um, our, my email box is flooded and I'm, I'm at University of Virginia. Um, and to learn that our, our president, Teresa Sullivan had just been ousted by this overnight coup by part of the board of trustees and our amazing student journalist, the daily cavalier within a week, um, had had access to emails from the board of trustees and they had been circulating. These are heady days. I don't know if we've, we've forgotten them, but it seems so perilous. And, uh, all of these articles from the New Yorker, the Wall Street Journal and the Times about MOOCs, you know, MOOCs were going to take over the world. And it turned out that our BOV members, board of our trustees had been circulating this, some of them amongst themselves, and um, felt as though President Sullivan, Teresa Sullivan, um, was uh, very much behind the technological curve. And UVA within five years would be irrelevant because we didn't have a MOOCification plan. Um, needless to say, uh, a lot of people maybe thought otherwise, and I found myself for the rest of the summer, along with neighbors, students, and my colleagues on the lawn here in front of the rotunda, um, protesting, and I mean, the faculty members, you know, out in our shorts in the Virginia, central Virginia heat, what in the world are we doing? Uh, and our neighbors and my, you know, kids on my back with shoulders, and that was the moment for me where, oh, all of these, you know, mantras that we had on the posters about liberal education, public goods, not just private goods, uh, the internal goods of scholarship, things I didn't have language for except for those same cliches and idioms. Uh, I realized that um, I, I had a lot to think about. And so <laughs> the course of my book changed and I've been reading and writing, um, trying to figure out this institution, the social order ever since uh, 2012. And then, and then 20, three years later, our new dean, 
ask me to lead a revision of our undergraduate education program. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, but that was the next step, which kind of propelled me on. So it was very much experiential and um, kind of external compulsion to figure out what in the hell was happening in this institution that turns out I had just taken for granted for most of my entire life. That's so interesting. Thank you, Chad. Susan, although your research does not directly address the modern research university, your historical inquiries certainly intersect with that topic in various ways. And of course, you've spent uh, your adult life working in and helping to administer some of the world's most distinguished research universities, for example, as dean of undergraduate education at Harvard. Could you tell us about some of the personal and intellectual experiences that shape your thinking about the state of modern research universities today? Yes. Um, I guess there's a sort of origin story that isn't all that different from Chad's. Um, so I went to Harvard at uh, 18 in 1977, and um, my I'm the only um, one of four children to go through college. Uh, and that's for a bunch of different reasons, personal and financial. Um, so, but I went to Harvard. I had never seen the place. I had gone to the public library and looked up the address and written to it and said, I'd like to go there. So they sent me an application. Um, so I had a very profound kind of immediate sense of affinity with um, the research university, bizarrely. I don't know why, um, but the second day I was there, I took a tour of Widener Library and I felt like someone had very nicely built this library for me. And <laughs> I was going to use as much of it as I could um, in the time I was there. And though, you know, Harvard was a complicated place in those days, particularly for, I think, young women. But, um, and I did get kind of tired at some point. I took a leave between my junior and senior years. And I went to London, not on study abroad, because those things didn't really exist in that way back then. And um, just with, you know, what I'd save from a summer job and some contact names and this sort of thing. And, but I found myself pretty quickly finding the London Feminist History Group. And then I found a senior thesis topic. And then I found myself, I was illegally waitressing to put, keep body and souls together. But um, uh, I found myself spending most of my time in the Imperial War Museum in London doing what would become my senior thesis research. Um, and I kind of, that kind of was very decisive. I figured out that if this is what you do when you're not in school, there's a kind of path forward, which is the path of being a scholar. And so I stayed at Harvard for graduate school and then I stayed there for another 20 years. And um, I think that time as, so I ended up having a lot of experience, administrative experience, I think partly because I was part of a very small set. There weren't very many uh, young women who were internally promoted at that time. So um, I, I was asked to do a lot of stuff quite fast. That was, I don't think had a huge amount to do with me, but it was um, kind of what I represented. So um, I did um, get kind of brought up quite quickly after I got tenure and spent some time as dean for undergraduate education. And there I had a pretty strong sense of what could be better about Harvard undergraduate education. It was... Um, uh, the Harvard houses provide, you know, these little kind of college-like things provide for a lot of um, collegiality or friendship among the undergrads, and that's great. But the first-year students can be a little isolated, and they're not in majors yet, and they're in often quite big entry courses. That was certainly my experience as a first-year student. But there was this lovely but near moribund little program of freshman seminars 
And I thought, huh, okay, well, we can expand that. And people said, you can't because we don't have the faculty resources. But I thought, actually, the people who are good at teaching 300-person undergraduate lecture courses aren't the same people who are good at teaching undergraduate 12-person seminars on the particular thing that they are most fanatical about. You know, they'll do that for free. (laughs) They're so fanatical about something. So if you just say, please teach the thing you're most fanatical about, it proved very, very easy to grow that program and to make it into something that a student could, any first year student could have one of them. And circuitously, we were solving some other problems. You know, it's always not a good thing if first year students aren't seen by someone who knows their name and knows them in a routine way. There's advising, but it's good to have another layer of that. And this was also doing that. We knew that, you know, there were those human contacts, then that would be very good. So it was really fun doing that. I had a fun time. I mean, I, the reason I've done quite a lot of, um, not so much anymore, but did back then do quite a lot of academic administration was that it was um, possible to do things. And, you know, if you were, could persuade people and Harvard, it was unique, of course, in that I, yeah, I think now there's like, a different kind of budgetary oversight, but no one ever told me we didn't have money to do anything ever. And um, so being Dean for undergraduate education was great. People would say, I have a good idea for this. And I'd say, great, let's do it. (laughs) So it was really, it was a very fun job. Um, And I did think of it as a way of recreating for students who, you know, the, f- the first year student is can be quite isolated who come from all over the place, some without prior connections to the university and they don't know anyone. I didn't know a single soul, not just at Harvard, but on the whole of the East Coast. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, it it is possible to do something that recreates that, that experience I had of like profound identification with something that you care enormously about for no particular reason, for whatever reason. So we'll, we'll go now to, to talking about what do we mean when we talk about not just the modern university, because there are a lot of different kinds of universities, but the modern research university. So Chad, in the opening of your book, Organizing Enlightenment, you ask the question, what are we talking about when we talk about the modern research university? So I'd like to ask you to answer that question for us from the perspective of your own research. You trace the DNA, so to speak, of the modern research university to the anxieties of late 18th century German intellectuals and argue that similar cultural anxieties confront us today. So could you tell us a bit more about these anxieties and the implications that they hold for um, thinking about what makes a research university in the contemporary cultural, economic, political landscape. Yeah, I think, so as I, as I mentioned, mookification was the, was the looming, the tsunami, I think, as Stan, then Stanford president put it um, in, a, in a New Yorker piece that was also circulated, it turned out, uh, among our board of trustees. And so at that point, I was trying to, to make sense of relationships between technologies and kind of knowledge institutions. And one, one thing as, as again, you know, I, I thought I was writing this book, trying to understand history of search practices and, and, and organizing knowledge uh, technologically, kind of a Google before Google thing. Um, but as, as I was doing this and my, my first fields are, you know, primarily kind of the, the law, I call it the long 18th century uh, in, in uh, German speaking lands and, and across Europe between, you know, 1690 uh, to, to 1910, very long, expansive 18th century. Um, what, one thing that became very clear to me in, in like central figures, you know, Kant, um, Fichte, Schleiermacher, these central German philosophical figures was the frames in which they put their claims about the authority of knowledge. And it it was in one way, 
put over against the proliferation of print um, in this flood. So the metaphor is about floods of print, um, you know, seas, not just of information, but seas of, of, of printed text. And the question became, and it was actually a proposal um, by Prussian bureaucrats around uh, 1800, that do we actually need universities, right? Do we actually need these gilded, antiquated um, institutions of privilege in light of the fact that print, the cost of print is going down rapidly? And in some ways it was, you know, in the final decades of the 18th century, new print technologies allowed for, you know, a uh, greater circulation of print. Literacy rates were improved, were increasing some, but not, you know, dramatically. And the argument that was marshaled, not only, um, I think, as uh, kind of self, a self-interested um, argument, but also um, a collective socio-political argument, um, was that, um, yes, we have lots of print. Yes, we have lots of text. Yes, students uh, don't need the professor to engage simply in a folleson, literally reading a text aloud and commenting on it. Um, but they need to see thinking in action, you know, to paraphrase Fichte. And this, you know, teaching students how to think, which is kind of ironic given how that's become, you know, a, a, a mantra of teaching centers in colleges and universities over the past two or three decades. But that was kind of the claim that uh, there is a distinction to be made, a distinction to be drawn, and a distinction that's needed between a printed text and their ever increasing proliferation and reduplication and the moment of creative thought, you know, where you can see a Fichte in Jena lecturing to a group of two to 300 students, which was actually happening, you know, in 1795. Kant makes a similar type of argument um, in you know, one, one, one of his texts. And what was amazing to me was that this was an argument that um, it turned into a, a debate among Prussian bureaucrats and the king around the turn of the century about, do we need a university? Um, and much of the normative impulse, much of the vision of what a university could do, especially in Berlin, um, this is just about, and also during you know, the French kind of occupation of Berlin, you know, 1806 or so, um, was that a, a university was not simply for the distribution of information, the distribution, however, more efficient of text, but also, uh, for the exemplarity and the institutionalization of something like an epistemic authority, something like a trustworthy knowledge. And that was the vision and all the memos that, that led up to, in 1810, the founding of the University um, of Berlin. Um, but it really was a normative vision because it, it you know, uh, it, it kind of failed <laughs> in, in a certain way. So that book ended up being about kind of history of disciplinarity, the history of epistemic authority and kind of the charismatic authority of, of, of universities, especially a research university. New knowledge is produced, not just transmitted from your. Um, and very quickly, the other, we'll call, it, we'll call them external legitimations, external goods, external reasons and justifications for universities uh, were needed. And universities in Prussia, University of Berlin, just being one of them, quickly became the locus and the institutional center of um, credentialing Prussia's bureaucracy, credentialing and training and examining um, the, uh, the secondary school teachers, which were at that point radically expanding. And so, and, and so on the one hand, the research university um, arose out of anxieties about epistemic authority and technological change. And at the same time, and over the over the course of the 19th century, and I'll just in here kind of proleptically, um, what happened to that project was you may you could put it you know it was captured by the state or it captured the state. You know I don't know how uh, we want to describe it, but it became not just a locus of intellectual authority and intellectual practice amidst technological surplus and media surplus. It became itself. Over the, the development of the course of the 19th century and the development of into the modern research university and higher education system, um, it became uh, a social organizational, a social ordering mechanism that was bound up with various publics, that was bound up with the state. And by the end of the 19th century, the, the primary function of the research university 
in Germany at least, and the US contrast is interesting and perhaps also similar, was, uh, was the credentialization of a new class of civil uh, bureaucrats, but also what we might call them professional experts. Um, and so that kind of transition from the locus of charismatic epistemic authority into a social system on par with, and a social revolution on par with, I, you know, I would argue, uh, industrialization, Germany industrialized, of course, uh, much later uh, than many other European countries, um, uh, but also mass democratization. That became, um, I think, its most uh, distinct feature. And that's that's the, the, the shift that I've been really fascinated with and, and continue uh, to work on. And also how that was adopted, ad, ad, in, in, but ad, adapted in very distinct ways across the Atlantic in the U.S., very interesting. Um, so Susan, we, we wanted to pose the same question to you, a definitional question. What makes a modern research university? But perhaps from a slightly different vantage point. So in your work on the League of Nations, you develop a distinctive way of understanding complex institutions. Specifically, you argue that the League of Nations should not be seen as a unitary actor that did this or that. Um, rather, the League, you describe it as a marina force field made up of shifting alliances, networks, institutions that a host of different actors entered into and sought to exploit for various reasons. So does this way of thinking about the League of Nations as an arena for rivalry and or collaboration help us think more clearly about the nature, history, operations of the modern research university? Or would you define and characterize this knowledge institution in a different way? Um. So that's a very interesting question, kind of clever question. Uh, I don't think the league is really much like the university, no. I mean, they're, they're both complex institutions and I that's what I do. I study complex institutions, but I don't study the university. I study, you know, I worked on welfare states and then I worked on parliament and its relation to the civil service, and then I worked on the league. And um, the league is unusual in that uh, it it's an arena that it's very easy to enter. It's a uh, um, people thought of it as like the post box for the world. You have a grievance of some sort, and you send it off to Geneva. Um, but it and it has a lot of trouble making political decisions because it doesn't control its own structure. It's a a mal, you know amalgam of stuff with uh, po political decisions largely in the hands of a council that is great power dominated and very very hard to manage, particularly in this period um, when you know powers are at each other's throats. And so it 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 has a terrible it has terrible trouble making political decisions. Um, it's quite effective if you wanted to find like little, little lakes of competence, you'd go and look for, um, you know, the way it led to uh, the development of various, what, what the league called technical organizations, we wouldn't call them that, you know, World Health Organization, that kind of thing. League of Nations Health Organization becomes a World Health Organization, you know, Nansen Committee becomes UNHCR. It's that kind of, those, those threads, and th those are quite effective. But I, I don't, I can't, work through an analogy between that and the university because the dynamic is quite different. I mean, the university, universities like the ones I've been at are, um, you know, alliances or amalgamations of separate complex institutions in themselves, mostly schools, and they actually control quite you know, they control their who who's in and who's out there. They pick their own faculties and they control um, admission. And, you know, so it's not a place you can just go if you feel like it. You know, you have to apply and you have to get selected and you have to, it's all that kind of thing. And I think the relations between the universe, the 
different bodies at the university is very complex. It's not the same at all universities, but um, at least the ones I've been at, there's there's a kind of complicated, I wouldn't say battle, but kind of struggle struggle over um, where the center is trying somehow to lead what is a very, very fractious and devolved um, set of faculty, separate faculties, separate institutions. Some universities look like hospitals with a little college attached. You know, some of them look like basically professional schools. Some, so I don't, um, I mean, that's a very complicated structure. Um, arts and sciences tends to be the intellectual heart of that, but um, it isn't the financial, often the financially strongest part. And so the structure is always complicated and the kind of arguments tend to be over things like common charges. Those are fierce arguments at the universities um, I've been at. Um, and, you know, presidents of universities try to project some common purpose often. And usually what happens, you know, they have some vision for something they're going to do. And um, that's very important for the public facing nature of the university. But often the schools respond to that very differently. They kind of scratch their heads and then they try and figure out how they can you know, sign on for whatever that enterprise is and turn it to their own um, uses. And, you know, sen the center will always speak a language of cross-institutional vision and interdisciplinarity. But I, I personally think we have disciplines for a reason. I mean, because that's where expertise lies and you actually want people who know what they're talking about, not who are, you know, just deciding they're, you know, scholars of the world or something and are willing to talk on any subject. So, you know, those are always complicated. And I've been part of various interdisciplinary things and we usually end up concluding we have disciplines for a reason. So, um, you know, the historians say, well, that's how historians work. And the literary critics say, well, I'm a literary critic. And, you know, you learn something. You always learn something. But I, I don't, I've never seen it really, seen people really change their ways very much. So, you know, there's always that, that's the dance of the university, the center trying to project something and the schools kind of hanging on to what makes them distinctive. There's a, there's a, there's a contrast here, I think. And I think historically there's a historical contrast um, say with 19, because if we say the, the German university is this kind of mythic thing and it's, it's, it's mythic in many ways. Um, one, there was no, so when I think of the research university, especially kind of the German or the Prussian model, um, what I think of is a system of public institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so the university, to my mind, doesn't name or even refer to, in the first instance, distinct institutions, the University of Berlin, uh, right, or Leipzig or, or Halle uh, over the course of the 19th century. And it took a lot of work, right? It took, in, in a way, the kind of the invention of university statistics, uh, you know, Prussian bureaus collecting lots and lots um, of, of data. And that wasn't even happening, uh, you know, until the mid uh, 19th century when, you know, uh, kind of future presidents of American research universities were already studying in, in, in Heidelberg. Um, and one difference um, between kind of a, a German research university ideal and what would then become an American research university ideal is that the German, especially the Prussian one, was always a system. And not just a system of universities with no qualifying research universities. I mean, a university was by definition research, right? The production of new knowledge and the production of new relationships uh, and production of new experts and specialists, right? As, as, as Susan was suggesting. Um, that 
and, and if you kind of if you try to map that onto what what happens in the U.S. context, you get some fascinating similarities, but a lot of, of a lot of differences, right? And in, in some ways, that it's a you know uh, the history of, of the research university in the U.S. of the course of the 20th century or the last three decades of the 19th century is a battle over just this question, right? To maintain something of the singular institutions with lots, as Susan, you were saying, like internal differentiation and conflicts on that level. Um, but a lot of resistance to attempts by already by the the, the Carnegie Foundation in the, the first two decades of the 20th century to shape a national university or at least a national system. Now, of course, in the, by the mid 20th century, uh, we do have sis- state systems of higher education, one of the you know most um, well known of which was the University of California. Um, highly stratified. And so it repeats all of the conflicts and, and stratifications that Susan uh, was talking about, but at a state system level. Um, but the, the German system was, was a system, but that also included secondary institutions like the gymnasium, right? So the, 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 the high schools that would certify students to go on and study at a uni- university, then they were related to their others, like the more Realschulen, uh, you know, the, the more vocational schools, all the way down to the primary schools. So this effort to build a public system of education to core, like as an entire national project, um, was in, in fascinating ways rejected, tweaked, and or just ignored uh, in, in, in the U.S. Uh, context. And I think to this day, what is it, we have more than 4,000, something like that now, 4,500, I'm not sure where we are now, uh, post-secondary institutions, and it's a, it's a giant mess. And, and there are wonderful things about that. And there are, you know, shall we say, less, less wonderful uh, things about that. Well, our next question goes in that direction. But Susan, I saw you nodding. I don't know if you want to react to, to what Chad said immediately. OK, well, as the name of this, this speaker series suggests, we're beginning from the premise that the modern university needs to be reimagined. I want to turn, therefore, to the level of diagnosis first. Do you accept that premise? Does the modern research university require reimagination? Um, if so, and, and even if not, what are the most notable dysfunctions or crises of the modern university from your perspective, and why do they exist? Susan, let's start with you. Okay. Um, the premise question, I think, is really tricky. Um, partly because for for the reasons that Chad said, it's a very, very complex landscape, university landscape. The problems faced by some parts of it are not at all the problems faced by other parts of it. So even diagnosing what the problem is would be individual and very hard, right? Not, it's not a, a, a single system. And I should be very, very clear. I don't study this. And I also only know from the inside one part of it. And that is a tiny part when it comes to education. We are educating a tiny proportion, you know, these like the Ivies and, you know, or the you know, big research universities, most students aren't in those institutions. And um, our problems are are kind of odd and I think not the same as, as, we can't talk across the board. Um, That said, there are, um, there are some things that I think, I mean, when you ask for what specific problems I think there's a specific dysfunction crisis problem, and it's not. I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know, um, and and that's just cost. The financing is of this whole operation is is not really working. There's a handful of very very wealthy institutions, very well endowed, and a handful of small, very rich um, liberal arts colleges, and they can do a beautiful job, bespoke job for their students. Um, But most institutions are not that. And 
um, for most institutions, the fact that we don't have a single system has kind of unleashed a level of competition. We're all fishing in the same pond for uh, faculty and for students. And, but, you know, the, the ways in which people, institutions are able to do that is very variable. And um, most institutions are highly tuition dependent. That's where they get their money from not from endowment, but from students paying tuition. And, you know, some lucky institutions have enough money to discount tuition quite a lot and to offer need-blind admission and to offer a lot of financial aid, but a lot don't. And I think, it, it, I mean, I'm at Columbia. Columbia is very expensive. And we do meet student need, which is very good. But um, the finances of um, universities are are complex, and they're dependent on on um, they have to universities have to teach students, and that's our first and most fundamental mission. We also do research. And of course, but we're research and teaching institutions and we teach students. And, you know, we know about the growth of the cost of, of education in this country, and it's not a happy story. So that's the biggest problem. It's very, very expensive. And for a lot of places, a lot of places cannot offer the kind of financial aid that, you know, institutions like this one will. Or, and, you know, so we have all the problems we hear about all the time, all the student debt, all the, you know, inability of, of talented students to go to the kinds of places they want to go. Um, you know, we've got the way universities respond to financial pressures, which is moving towards adjuncts and um, all that kind of thing. And so that's actually, I mean, I would say that's a, you know, that's just, I don't know very much about that because I'm just watching it. I'm just watching it. Um, and from a very, very privileged position with this, you know, at a institution that does get excellent undergraduates and does, you know, offer them need blind admission and meet need. Um, so that's one thing. I mean, I think the other thing it, that isn't a crisis, but is a uh, not at all a crisis. It's an opportunity, but a challenge is how in hard times we balance our, what are kind of almost three separate things, you know, credentialing. So doing the kind of thing that to some extent students want us to do. They want us to give them degrees that get them into the next thing. So that and uh, a mission to respond to the kind of crisis of our time, crises of our times, which is a kind of social mission. Columbia actually has a long history of doing this. And because it's in New York and it's quite a public facing institution, it thinks about that a lot. Um, but also the third thing, which I think is this kind of, you know, you know, the universities, the research universities are also the places that should be teaching Byzantine history as the waters of global warming close over our heads, right? So, you know, there's a kind of foundational research mission that is, is you know, it's a, it's a good because we care about the preservation and expansion of knowledge. And so balancing those things, I think, is quite tricky. Those are three things that are all very important. Um, and the balance is different at different places. But I think it's a, you know, it's a ongoing conversation. And um, 
you know, the universities put their resources, you know, if you hire this kind of a person, you can't hire that kind of a person, you know, you can, you might want, we're trying to build up a climate school, you know, on the other hand, we've got a lot of other needs as well. It's those sorts of things that always are, um, you know, very, there are complicated trade-offs in any institution, like, you know, in any arts and sciences, right? Um, and it's, it's, I don't have any, it, you know, way to think about that. That's anything except saying those exist. They have to be talked through, you know, they have to be de decided with a commitment to all three of those things. Right. right. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Chad, before I put the, the same questions to you, I'd like to share uh, what I found to be a striking passage in your most recent book with Paul Ryder. You write, when people reckon with ongoing crises, and more specifically, ongoing crises that threaten them in basic ways, they often look for one dramatic, all-encompassing cause, the Great Recession, neoliberalism, the coronavirus. Identifying a situation as a crisis can foreclose the possibility that, that it came about not because of an unexpected sudden event, but because of chronic, even structural conditions. Chad, what do you see as the most notable dysfunctions or crises of the modern university? And what are some of the chronic structural conditions that have led to them? I'll talk from um, 30,000, maybe 78,000 feet uh, for, for a second since you're asking about uh, structural conditions. And um, and, I, and I should say, I mean, the, the book I'm, I'm finishing now is called After the University, and um, and it's trying to understand just that and and, and kind of look look forward. And kind of the one of the key historical shifts, because that, you know, that's what I do. I, I think historically with texts and, and things like that. So that's how I think and talk. Um, over the course of the 19th century is a shift from, you know, what you could call the universitas to the university. So the universitas as kind of a, a centuries old guild of scholars and teachers, right? I mean, that's what the first uh, universities were. And largely they were that until the 19th century, until the, the different models of the research university. In fact, many of the arguments for why Berlin needed a new institution of, of higher learning and higher knowledge uh, was to constrain the most um, antiquated guilds, i.e. the universities. I mean, that, that was the argument of political economists starting to work in uh, the, the Prussian ministries, who, who, of course, would then go on to, to fund, you know, uh, at unprecedented levels, um, what we now just take for granted almost as some of the first research universities. And so it was this effort to on behalf of a new, newly articulated public, you know, uh, kind of called forth and crafted by uh, new new state offices and, 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 and new state powers um, to, to check this old vision of a university as a guild, right? A, a guild with very particular, very circumscribed interests, which are then protected by a sovereign. And instead to offer up this institution that was public. Now, you know, public and democratic, in you know uh, early 19th century Prussian context differs sharply from uh, public and democratic you know late 19th century American context right and the arguments that you get um, you know at a, at a early at a young University of Chicago or at the University of Wisconsin I mean those are very different arguments even though the words are the same right you know a, a public democratic institution. But I would argue that you know in, in both instances there is a, a kind of a fundamental contradiction, a fundamental tension. And that's that no longer is the universitas as a guild, simply this, 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 this body, this corporate body recognized by a sovereign to protect the particular interest of a craft, call it scholarship. But now it's called forth to not only diagnose social problems and, uh, but also to solve them, right? Uh, that, you know, whether it's creating Prussian bureaucrats, whether it's creating the secondary school teachers um, that are going to then populate German gymnasium and, and, and secondary schools, or in the American context, increasingly, right, by the end of the 19th century, create democratic citizens, uh, forge uh, a democratic 
uh, republics. So, not, so now they, they're diagnosing the social problems and they're called to, to solve those social problems of the day. And to, to me, that, that burden uh, the, on, kind of projected onto formal institutions and formal educations um, in, some, in some ways just kind of punted over off into these um, institutions um, is if it's not a structural contradiction, I mean, I think it is, it's a, it's a, it's a tall, it's a tall order. And, you know, it, in uh, one particular crisis that continues to show up, one of my favorite examples is um, of this, because you see versions of it, and it's kind of a, the crises of capitalism, the, the recurring crisis of, of capitalist forms, you know, in the 1830s, as, as Prussia is first collecting these statistics to try to understand how many students they have enrolled, what they're studying, uh, and, and then what they do afterwards, there is um, the, uh, this one office, um, Prussian statistical office in Berlin, um, they know and report dutifully kind of up the chain that um, there is now in the early 1830s uh, a mismatch between the number of students studying law and the number of lawyers that uh, all the different bureaus need. And what is the state gonna do about it, right? Um, the state is very reluctant to just declare that, okay, now law faculties at Prussia's universities can't accept anymore or they should reduce them. Uh, so they try to get the word out, like, like quite literally. I mean, they do propaganda already at the, the secondary school levels. Like, there are no places, you know, there are no, uh, there, there are no jobs for you if you, if you study law. And so within two to four years, you do see, a, you, you do see a, a decline. Um, and so, but then, I mean, this is just the, the, the crisis of the, you know, kind of the excess, the surplus students. I mean, this is why Marx, you know, he studied law. He wanted to go work in a bureau too. He is, he refers to himself as academic shfema, which is just kind of academic uh, flotsam, you know, just floating around you know, with no, with no place to land, no place to go. So of course he goes uh, and does reportage and, and, and becomes Marx. But it's this recurrent uh, crisis that um, on the one hand, the university feels compelled to, it, it, it asserts itself as uh, this, this lone dedicated community to knowledge production or scholarly craft, internal goods, the fanaticism that, that Susan was talking about earlier on. So that's what it does internally when it talks to its faculty, but externally when it's trying to get the money to support that, when it's trying to get the public support to do that, when it's trying to get the state support uh, to do that, it has to make all these crazy promises. Um, like it can judge labor markets, that it can in fact create labor markets, that it can create a uh, political solidarities and that it can um, at the both maintain the distinction and the balance of internal goods right? So scholarly ideals and epistemic values on the one hand, while at the same time satisfy and produce um, wanted and desired social effects, as, it, as, as the Prussian bureaucrats, whom I was mentioning earlier, put it, that they can identify and satisfy the real social needs. So structurally, I see that as, as I, that's one way to understand these tensions that Susan was just, no pun intended, cashing out um, and it's kind of the repetition of these. And I think they get extreme and more acute as, as we kind of cross the Atlantic and with U.S. projects to introduce what, you know, Clark Kerr and the UC folks call, you know, mass democratic um, education. So, hmm. so, Thank you. So we want to turn now to the flip side of that question. Um, and, and I think you've begun to answer this as well in some ways. What are some of the features of the modern research university that you think it would be important to preserve? Uh, Chad, let's start with you this time. Yeah, the belligerent, the persistence of, of, of internal goods, right? So even if, for, to my mind, like, one of the most salient effects of the modern research university and this kind of collision course um, with uh, modern industrial capitalism is the sharp distinction between internal and external goods that that somehow the university can be this mediating agent, uh, this mediating system between internal goods of of scholarship, of of, of inquiry, of uh, the synonyms, you know, just kind of can aggregate them: liberal education, uh, uh, undergraduate education, college 
uh, they, they, they go by all of these different things as opposed to vocational professional, um, simply use oriented, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, amidst all that, that those internal goods do persist almost despite themselves. And I think that's my kind of late 19th century progressive idealism. Like I still, however, I can't disabuse myself of that kind of faith in education that it will always discipline, but also possibly liberate us. Like if, if you do have, as Susan says, you got a good library, it surely happened to me. I went to Davidson and I'd never even really been in, I'd never been on a, the campus of a college or a university. And like, oh my God, like, like this is all I have to do all day? Like read? I mean, it was, it was absurd. Um, and there are still places like that. That is for the vast majority of the 4,500, 4,600 institutions in the U.S., that is not the case, like manifesting not the case, uh, I, I don't think, or even a place like University of Virginia. Um, that's the case for some students. But the reality of, of a lot of students is, okay, a full course load and a full-time job. Um, and, and so the, the opportunity I had at Davidson on scholarship to just go sit in the library um, is, is, is rare. But that, again, I know it's 75,000 feet. But though that possibility, even just as a proposition, that um, even if it's manipulated by a broader system, that on the one hand, that these institutions, colleges, and universities motivate the broader public, people like me and Susan, uh, and I imagine you, to believe in the possibilities of higher learning and discipline study. But on the other hand, they have to mollify those, right? Because there's a disjuncture uh, between or, or a gap between the the idea that education can solve all these problems, but it can also individually liberate you. Um, there's a gap between that and kind of the institutional means at our disposal currently in the current social conditions to satisfy and guarantee that for everybody. And that causes social tensions, structural tensions, and individual pathologies uh, as as well, that that disjuncture. So, thank you, Susan. Um, I tend to agree pretty much with that. I mean, the things that I think are remarkable, I mean, I think it is very remarkable um, that there is in the United States and has been for quite a while mass higher education. And that's when you look at the that exists in the UK now, right? If you are in the UK now, pretty much everybody knows people who are in university or going to university, the universities, the, you know, regional universities, the red bricks, all of those are, they're also crucial to the towns they're in, you know, these, in some cases, blighted towns are revitalized by the presence of a university, right? And I think that's very important. It used to be such a small proportion, you know, very early school leaving age in the UK, well into the 20th century, very small numbers of people going to university. The advent of mass higher education, that's an unalloyed good. And, um, you know, I think it's very good that the U.S. has this as well. And I I actually love the model in the United States. It's just very beset right now for some of the reasons Chad laid out. You know, it's students are very stressed. It's hard times. And they and their parents understandably think of this as a credentialing thing. It's, you know, if you talk to academics, you get this kind of answer that Chad and I both had, which was about how much we love going to the library. And, you know, so obviously we're, ve I'm very wedded to that model where you have a, a kind of, where young people are given four years of a kind of space and it's not it is they are they do have to get jobs afterwards but you know it, that's not the main thing they also have to take i mean it is remarkable how unspecialized we are right by comparison that you know um i mean i also 
spent a lot of time in Berlin and my daughter, my son is there now at the Humboldt and, um, you know, the, his friends have been specializing since, you know, they're reading law. They've been doing that since they were 18 and, you know, they just don't, no one has the kind of do whatever you like in this liberal arts way our students tend to like to specialize because they want to accumulate as many credentials as possible. And we force them not to. I mean, we force them to take a bunch of things. In some cases, they don't want to take. I think sometimes we're a little silly about this. You know, if you look at the faculties of universities on the humanities side, there are a bunch of people who figured out how to get out of their science requirement. And then we say all these pious things about how terrible that is when our students are (laughs) trying to do exactly the same thing. Um, so, you know, we like specialization, but we do impose distribution requirements, a liberal arts education, things like that. And I think that's, that's very good. Not, it's a, it's a precious time of life in a way. And, um, I know that it's lots of students don't have it. That's not, Chad's exactly right. That's not the experience of higher education for tons of people, but it's it's not unthinkable for a lot of people. And I think that in itself, just to, just that it's possible that the, you know, that you will hear about it and you can try to do it if you want to. And it's hard and there are lots of impediments, but I think the actual vision of it is is still a very um, appealing one of American liberal arts education, college, mass education. So we wanted to turn now to this uh, idea of the modern research university as a vehicle for social transformation. Um, So Susan, in your book, The Guardians, as well as in some of your essays uh, in the London Review of Books, for example, you mentioned how Black scholars like Elaine Locke, Ralph Bunch, Eric Williams, leverage the existing structures of universities to critique and help transform existing colonial norms and structures. So maybe you could give us a sense of how these and other similar scholars were navigating and utilizing the often socially and politically conservative institutions of the university toward their transformative ends? Um, let me, yeah, okay, I'm still, uh, yeah, that's a complex question. I guess first I need to say that, um, you know, my writing on this was really, I mean, I review quite a lot for the LRB and um, that was a, I was writing about Bob Vitalis's really excellent book, White World Order, Black Power Politics. And there's been quite a lot of work on um, that kind of constellation of African-American intellectuals. Um, Pearl Robinson's written on that. And there's also a biography of Merce Tate coming out by Barbara Savage. But it isn't, I mean, they're not... they are leveraging the universities, but um, I think it's important to say that the real institution here that mattered was the historically black college. It was ha- they were all at Howard. That was like the history do- department at Howard that you, <laughs> you're talking about, and um, they a number of them had Harvard PhDs, and they all. Um, worked on, and Bunch came out of UCLA, so they're from different, you know, institutions. Um, They are, they have what is not a common project, but a a intersecting set of projects, and they all are working on, in some way, the transition, uh, um, the transition from an imperial order to a state-centered world and to independent states. And for Bunch, of course, that wasn't just his scholarly work. I mean, he wrote a dissertation on um, essentially what difference the mandate system made. I mean, that's how I got interested in him. He's, he, 
is one of the people who wrote a very grounded empirical account of administration in two neighboring territories, one Togoland under French mandate and the other, what was then Dahomey. And he's looking at, you know, did it make a difference to have this international oversight that is what the mandate system was? And he kind of concludes, yeah, but not that much, right? <laughs> which is sort of what you think. I mean, I t- think that that's absolutely right. There's no, um, the effects of the mandate system aren't felt in mandated territories. They're felt in international norms more than anything else and in Geneva, but Bunch took all that scholarly work and then he became head of the trusteeship council at the UN. And interestingly, Locke and Rayford Logan as well, also at Howard, um, they all wrote on the mandate system. And because it is the thing that seems to be, you know, something that's happening that might be moving the, you know, might be, have some hope of taking the imperial order apart. And it doesn't really, but it is a stage of a kind. So, but, and they do have, they, they are, American institutions are quite important in this because they're wealthy and um, because the U.S. isn't part of the league and because it also isn't formally, and it's not an imperial power the way the old European empires are. It's different. And so, you know, they are able to get support from, you know, some foundations for their work. A bunch is very remarkable because at that point, people wrote a lot about Africa, but never went. He actually goes and does research. He also spends some time working with Malinowski and London. So he's tied into these networks of people who are actually doing research. He also is kind of in correspondence with Raymond Leslie Buell, who's head of the Foreign Policy Association at the time and is somebody who also did a lot of research, went went and um, you know annoyed all kinds of people. There's lots of stuff in the League archives about how panicked all the administrations in mandated territories were because of Mr. Buell showing up. <laughs> and um, So they do manage to get some supports and some stuff. But I think, I think what is really most critical about that is that this is a network. There's a network of scholars who are kind of in communication with one another. They're working on the same thing and they're, they're, they have a, a common optic, a kind of angle of vision, you know, something, I mean, they're, they have what Du Bois would call double consciousness. They're able to see things that had been taken for, for granted. They're able to imagine something new and different. And so they do have, they do use the universities, but it's also important who they are is important and that they're tied into Howard is really important. So, yeah. So, Chad, how, how would you think about the modern research university as a vehicle for social transformation, but more specifically in the context of colonialism, empire, of a new world of nation states and you know, liberal rights? Um, and also, if there are any you know, particular observations or responses you can make to some of the, the points that Susan is raising as well. Yeah, I think I think the first thing I would say, and then I'll pivot kind of to the American context and um, in the context of what Susan was uh, saying, you know, in in the German nineteenth century context, um, it wasn't a question of is the university, the, the research university, a vehicle for transformation? Is it an instrument of social transformation? It constituted, in part, in crucial part, the social order. Right? I mean, the the, the it, it, I think you the mistake would be to presume um, some kind of object at you know uh, direct object force you know can the university contribute to society well i mean in in the context of the production of an entire state apparatus 
and uh, articulation of a public, um, it, it very much was was uh, producing, forming, and reproducing that that social order. The U.S. context is is interesting because um, it's it's similar but also very different. And just to offer one in in the vein of um, some of the questions that that Susan uh, was was addressing, I think um, for me a figure just over the past two or three years who's become crucial. In part, yes, I'll admit, uh, because he studied um, in Berlin in, in the early 1890s, and thus there are a lot of concepts that I can can track their the transformation and just kind of the fascinating things that he does, and that's of course uh, W. E. B. Du Bois. And w- one thing, you know, you know, how to how to think about social transformation, right? So for me, if one of one way I, in, in terms of that question. I immediately thought about it was, you know, the relationship, what I mentioned earlier, between internal and external good, right? The university as as as, as forming, as educating um, into forms of discipline study, um, or what Du Bois just calls science. But science, in my mind, with vestiges of a capital W Wissenschaft, you know, in, in, in the background, not simply the natural and physical sciences, um, you know, the relationship of, of those goods to external goods or questions of social reform, like how can you improve the lot of a particular people in a particular nation at a particular time? And what I find um, really compelling in juxtaposition to Du Bois's American contemporaries um, who were running and establishing the first departments of sociology uh, at Columbia, you know, for, for example, is his steadfast dual commitment. So on the, on the one hand, uh, this commitment to what he calls the search for truth or the task of a of disciplined study, right? Um, you know, just read his, his, his comments about U.S. historians on reconstruction. My God, I mean, he, he's criticizing them, of course, for their moral fa- failures and depravity, but in the first instance for like crappy scholarship, right? I mean, and he doesn't see a massive gap between the two. And, and so, and I think this is, this possible because, you know, he's, when he's working on, um, when he takes over the projects related to um, the studies of, of uh, black Southerners uh, at the University of Lan- uh, Atlanta, um, he draws this distinction um, when he's talking about what would a sociology or a social science of black Americans look like in the 1890s. He draws a distinction between the immediate and the immediate goods of science, right? So the immediate goods are the goods internal to disciplined scholarship and thinking, the kinds of things students, uh, Susan and I were imagining, you know, earlier on, right? Uh, The epistemic virtues and goods of uh, good disciplinary practice and and a truth seeking, as he calls it, right? So those are um, the immediate goods. Then he draws the distinction, and, and alongside that, the other one um, are the immediate goods, and those are the goods of social reform, right? How we can use the the fruits of good thinking, of good disciplined scholarship, of truth seeking, as he calls it, to reform this nation. And in, in his work in the 1890s and uh, for the decades that follow, uh, the place of, of of Black Americans, right? Like in, informed. Um, good scholarship or just disciplined thinking is necessary for social reform. Now, o- over the course of, course of his career, actually, which is by 1910, I think uh, he, he, was a, he was a bit more confident before that um, truth-seeking and its publication, like its sharing before publics, would disabuse um, Americans of, of their uh, racial domination and ideologies. And he kind of, you know, starts to to try to understand the relationship of not just a categorical distinction between immediate and immediate goods, but also uh, its effectiveness, like what else has to happen. But that's also where I see W.E.B. Du Bois and also, and I'm only learning about this kind of um, in the context of of decolonization in the 60s and 70s, um, especially in East Africa, the the question of social reform and kind of internal goods of disciplined thinking are reframed again 
right, in the context of decolonization, where you have arguments on behalf of, yes, the internal goods, and even uh, arguments about detachment, scholarly objectivity held up as goods, um, but also uh, that the search for truth has to be shaped by uh, our commitments to, you know, our children, our nation building project now. And so completely different ways of understanding this relationship between institutions of higher learning, between institutions of knowledge and social reform, not simply not the, the the kind of the one way the university produce, produces knowledge, which is then applied to reform society, but a much more complicated one, which acknowledges, among other things, scholars in universities as uh, people actually involved with the world, right? <laughs> with, with, with their own desire, desires, with their own commitments and their own responsibilities and how to understand that disciplined thinking that are seen as necessary for institutions, while also at the same time understanding the responsibility to what you're calling social transformation. So I, I see the, the, the real com different ways of thinking about detachment, scholarly objectivity. Um, I think Du Bois is, is one instance as he's kind of doing battle against um, turn of the century uh, US uh, white sociologist. And then, and I mentioned like 1970 kind of decolonizing universities. Uh, among other things, Clark Kerr is touring as, as president of the Carnegie Commission on Higher Education, um, advising uh, universities and, uh, and, and nations about how to uh, reform their uh, higher post-colonial um, higher education system. And his watchword, mind you, this is the hero of the mass democratization uh, golden age of higher education. Um, he's he's advising them on how to better incorporate human capital because that was the failing of the golden age of higher American education. They had ceased to uh, be more direct about that and to make that um, a private burden. So he said, uh, you know, this is Reagan, you know, fires him, as it were, at the or he encourages the trustees of the University of California to fire him at the end of the 60s when he becomes governor of California. And he's always celebrated that, well, that was the end of kind of zero tuition University of California um, higher ed. Three years later, he is in Kenya you making arguments about why students have to take out loans because as it turns out, the God of higher ed did not deliver in the United States and it probably is not going to deliver here. We have to understand it as a private good. So, and it, it, it's these amazing kind of turns of, of argumentation and, and social structure where the relationship between universities and social transformation never, never distinct, but always contested and in, in really kind of fascinating, and for me, like mind-blowing ways. Really interesting. Chad, in your book, uh, Permanent Crisis, you observe that many critiques of the university and of university-based knowledge in particular are not just epistemological, but they are also ethical. That is, they are about the kind of person that the university produces. Specifically, these critiques often concern the one-sidedness of the people who are formed by the disciplinary specialization of universities. Given the particular challenges and crises that our society currently faces, what kind of a person do you think the modern research university should produce? And in what ways would the modern university need to be reimagined in order to produce such a person? I'll put the question uh, perhaps a, a little bit more provocatively. If you were given, and, and it's a question to you both, if you were given free reign to establish a new university and money was no object, what kind of an institution would you design? And in particular, what kind of a person, what kind of capable agent, let's say, do you think this university should bring forth given the needs of our present age? Chad, you, you can go first and then, and then we'll turn to Susan. I think, I guess the first thing I would say that there's a, for at least for, to my mind, kind of a necessary correlative question which is, you know, what social order <laughs> would be required to produce, uh, inform the kinds of, of people uh, I'd love us all to be, including myself. Um, and I, I think that that question uh, has become the more pertinent um, to, to my mind. And um, it's also, I think, disabused me of, as I kind of acknowledged earlier, 
my um, unwarranted and I think also no longer all that helpful faith in informal higher education, that it's the, the panacea to all individual and social ills. Um, I, I don't share that faith anymore. Um, that doesn't mean I don't like colleges and universities. <laughs> I just don't think uh, that um, they're going to they're gonna help us out of this one um, in the ways that we have been betting on for kind of 150 years. So that said, <laughs> um, I think I, I, I wouldn't, if you gave me that money, I, I probably wouldn't design a university uh, right now. Um, I wouldn't use it to build a, a, a university because I think... Right now, under the current conditions, um, the pressure to define that university, however imagined, to define it in terms of what the university is now, which is you know kind of a credentialing mechanism uh, above all, a containment mechanism um, for, uh, for 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 conflict, and it, it's it's really bubbling over, as Susan <laughs> was was alluding to earlier. Um, wh whatever we tried to do now with how much ever money it would, it would reproduce those either in the positive, either in the positive or in the negative, right? It, it would just be the mirror image of them, but yet still be defined by the broader, um, uh, kind of social conditions and all of the contradictions that, that we were talking about, the social pressures. Um, that said, you know, I, you know, just, this is kind of the aspirational and this, this is my question now, what kinds of social forms and what kinds of institutions, now that I've said the university, as I understand it, is maybe not the place, which is why, you know, trying to figure out after the university, you know, it's it's one that's concerned with not simply the social effects of education and of higher learning discipline study, that is measurements like uh, who can access and then out the other end, the outputs like average lifetime earnings, you know, th those types of things, the things that sociologists tend to measure when they talk about higher education. Um, but also uh, kind of the meaningfulness of and the resonance and of, of social relations uh, and the, the the new forms of knowledge that can come out of those. I know that's really airy pie in the sky right now, um, but I just um, the university I don't think is going to is not going to get us there because it's so overdetermined. I think uh, as a as a social structure and not just as a particular institution. Um, that I think we need something much more, um, much, much more fundamental and much more radically democratic. And you know, we need we need institutions that that uh, that are like sponges where they can just go around sucking up the knowledge that everybody has mm -hmm. uh, in, in 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 all shapes and forms. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, there's a lot there I would agree with. Um, I think the um, the premise is tricky as well. Um, maybe because I'm from a the background I'm from, I actually don't. I would never want. I would not do anything in which money was no object. Um, I think it's bad for people. <laughs> it's ethically bad for them to be in a situation where money is no object. That's kind of part of our problem in the world right now. There are too many people for whom money is no object. So I think having to face trade-offs is what keeps us, you know, sort of honest and we have to acknowledge that they exist and so I wouldn't want to and, and you know some gazillionaire to come along and say you can have as much money as you like it wouldn't that's not what I want um I mean in terms of what kinds of forms I think are very important to preserve and what sort of not knowledge, but pro process of learning, I think is important. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky because um, Columbia, for reasons that have everything to do with complicated structures, has a very longstanding core curriculum that is 
very unwieldy. It's very heavy, but um, it's great at doing a couple of things. One is it's a great, a lot of it, it now has all kinds of other bits and pieces and bells and whistles on it because of, so it's huge, you know, and um, the good thing about that is it means students come here. We are the, we are able to be um, a humanistic institution because most of because students have to be willing to spend almost half of their time as undergraduates in a core curriculum that a lot of which is great books courses. And if they're not willing to do that, they don't come to Columbia, they go somewhere else. And so many of the things that my colleagues at other universities bemoan, like the history department has lost all their majors and this sort of thing, and everybody's majoring in computer science. We have none of those problems. We're huge. I mean, we have a problem. I mean, my department, we have a problem of managing to teach all our students, but, um, you know, we have this wonderful opportunity to teach the stuff we really love to very responsive students. And um, I also teach the core quite a lot. It's a, you know, it's a sort of syllabus you could never institute now. We start with Plato's, I mean, if you take the one train up to 116 on like September 19th, you know, 1,200 or 1,300 first year Columbia, no, second year Columbia college students will be reading Plato's Republic. That's what they're doing. They're going to read the whole thing. <laughs> and, you know, then we're going to go on to Nicomachean ethics and then we're going to go on to something else. And that's what we do. And I think, and the content of that is always contested and we're always changing it because we don't, you know, it's a very old fashioned syllabus and we think it should be different. And, you know, the students are always like, why are we reading? Why do we have to read this stuff? And, but it also has, it's the process that I think is so critical that students are meeting four hours a week with the same person, usually for a full year doing close reading. So it's that they have to talk to each other. They have to talk to us. And I think, you know, right now, what we face is a world in which everyone is sitting individually in front of their computer screen, going down rabbit holes of various kinds, right? And this is a way of not doing that, right? It's whatever else they're doing, they have to show up and do this. And quite a lot of their education here is that. And in it's funny what Chad said about we need a more you know, I think devolved, decentralized, democratic form of education, what I would want to preserve, I agree. And what I what was incredible about teaching during the pandemic, even though it was horrible, and I wasn't actually teaching CC then, I was doing a lecture course and a graduate seminar and then some more stuff. And, um, but it kind of reminded me that you just need the st- students and the book. I mean, you don't really need much else. And that's what CC is. You know, the buildings can be crumbling around you and you can still teach it. And so I would want to preserve that. I mean, partly that's the, I'm not a social scientist, but being a historian who works on institutions, I think the, the, form and the process are as important as the content and the content matters. It's great to have every, you know, all the students reading whatever they read Du Bois, they read Kant, they read, you know, Virginia Woolf, they read, they have to read all these things. And um, it's great that, that they read what they read and, you know, that we always argue about, you know, we want more and we want, you know, it's, It's an endless argument among the faculty and the students, but it also combats the things that we think are really problems 
right now, which is, you know, isolation, hyper-specialization, just demoralization, the depression, all of these kinds of things that we see at the university, but also in society in general, you know, they have to, they will form bonds that last often in these kinds of classes. And that's part of what we're doing. So we're both teaching stuff about you know, what is justice? How do we live together? But they're also forced to kind of enact it in the class. And I think that's very good. I would want to preserve something like that. I don't care all that much the form it's in, but also that's very easy for me to say because I, you know, teach at an institution where this is my job. That's like a very lucky thing to be able to do. Well, we have. Can I ask, can I respond to one of the questions? Is that? Please go ahead. All right. And it, it, it kind of re it relates very much, I think, Susan, what you were saying about I, what I heard in my kind of Hegelian transformation of it, uh, made of my own, um, and the, the import of, of, of disciplines and the, the import, not simply of expertise, but um, of, of real disciplined ways of thinking and, and, and studying. And there was a question about um, Bert, Bert and Clark and have marketization and centralization of management in a way chipped away at the autonomy or the, the capacity of disciplines to be defined by disciplines only disciplinary scholars in the broader kind of university. And it's funny because the, 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 the person who poses this question mentions Burton Clark, who, if I, if I remember correctly, I think he, he was a scholar of higher ed at UCLA. Is that, I'm not sure. Maybe they, they can, you know, deny or affirm that. It's it's ironic because, um, and the question is, is this changing kind of in unprecedented ways? The the UC system at places like Berkeley, UCLA, and then the new Irvine, already in the 60s, even in the late 50s, were already pioneering these, um, I forget what they're called. There was an acronym for it. It was like uh, like special research projects in, in the name of multidisciplinarity. Right. So these were problem or I always think of like it's kind of like the water curriculum. Right. So these are these are ways of organizing knowledge according to some discrete social problem. The funding, the interest and the compulsion for which were almost always external to the universities and external to these disciplines. And so it was the, the UC system pioneered kind of the funding mechanisms with federal dollars, uh, but also the internal administrative and structural ways to, to create all these now, you know, very like interdisciplinary units or you know, all these kinds of things, which, you, you know, there were some good, uh, some good things about that. But one internal thing, I think, effect you couldn't deny was the way it helped to erode uh, kind of disciplinary authority or even in some ways in the American context, departmental uh, authority. And that was kind of already um, up and running. Uh, in in uh, the mid the, the mid sixties, and it's continued apace and for various reasons, um, but the kind of the erosion of disciplinary authority, um, or the erosion of uh, kind of disciplined scholars to to, to mark and um, argue about boundaries, et cetera, has 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 been a long process. Yeah, I'm not sure how to entirely how to think about that. I feel um, that some of the financial problems I was talking about that face the universities, those are doing more than planning of or alternative models to threaten the universities. Um, partly because what scholars are good at is kind of really good at is, is a kind of odd type of resistance to central planning. They're just really good at that. You know, you there's a report saying we should do something or other, and we have long discussions about it, and then we form a committee to follow up on that. They issue another report, and you know, it's like, that's academic administration mostly. I mean, you can do some things, but you need to be have your wits about you and to be fairly agile. This kind of somebody comes up with a grand design. Maybe you can do that in the UC system, but it's really hard to do that kind of thing. It takes a lot of time and effort and planning and intelligence to make real. Because 
you know, we're all very, very attached to our little thing that we do. And we'll just get really upset whenever people try and interfere with our capacity to do that. So, you know, that kind of resistance, I think, is is the universities are good at. But I agree, they're not always all that great at, you know, responding to a problem or something like that. No. Sadly, we have to stop. Uh, I feel like this this conversation could go on uh, in very interesting directions for a long time. Um, Susan Peterson, Chad Wellman, such a stimulating conversation and a terrific way to kick off this series. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. And just again, to mention our sponsors, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, we hope you'll join us again next time on Friday, March 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern, when uh, we'll have the great pleasure of welcoming Malachi Cohen of uh, Duke University and Samuel Moyne of Yale to discuss reimagining the university in times of war. So we hope to see you all then. Thanks very much for joining in today. Chad, thanks, thanks again. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye.